Today, I'm in beautiful, sunny Santa Barbara, California, and with me, I have the one and only Scott Walters, and he has a YouTube channel. He lives here in Santa Barbara, California. He's a real estate agent, and he has been in and around real estate for about the last 22 years, so he knows his stuff here. How you doing, Scott? I'm good, Michael. It's good to see you. Thanks, man. I appreciate good you coming on. Good to see everybody on. there, too, yeah. Yeah. How I, you guys doing? I appreciate you coming on here and agreeing to do this with me, and I uh, really wanted to get your take on everything here in california especially real estate so uh let's just jump into it the number one thing that i think people want to know i see this all the time in the comments section is how do people have all of this money like you live in a very expensive area here obviously what is the average home cost here at least three four million dollars for most people you have to make a ton of money to be able to even qualify to get a mortgage for a home like that but what is happening? Like, are these people getting mortgages? Do they actually have the income? Do they pay cash? Like, who are these people? Mom and dad. Mom and dad. They usually get as the people that help. You know, yeah, there's a lot of old money in, in, in places like this in Santa Barbara. I was born and raised here. And oddly enough, Michael, you, back when before Santa Barbara became this huge tourist destination that we now see it is today, you could be a, a single family, blue collar wage earner, dad works, mom stays home and raises the kids. That's the way traditionally you could survive here in America. Now you've got to be not only a dual income family, a dual income white collar wage earning family. And even if you are, you still don't qualify for a home here in Santa Barbara. You need to bring a massive down payment to make sure your monthly is not going to be overwhelming to you in order to pull a mortgage at all. So it's getting trickier and trickier, which is why I'm going ahead and screaming from the rooftops, real estate bubble. I don't care. I know I have financial benefit. I know, I, you know it helps me to cheerlead these markets, but the reality is I'm in a position now where I don't have to. And so I'm going to give some real talk because I've seen this movie before. But a lot of the money here is uh, family money, old money. It's been here a while. Some of these people bought a long, long time ago before their houses were multi-million dollar houses. They were just average median home price houses at one point in time in this, in this city, but not anymore, which is making it harder and harder for the average American to get in. So somebody who's buying today, uh, you're saying mom and dad is helping. So basically because they bought 30, 40 years ago, they have the wealth and the home equity to be able to tap into, I guess, and give their children a huge down payment for a house. I mean, probably at least 50% down. I mean, in order to be able to buy with that sort of income, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, even you're right. So, I mean, it's all of, across the board. There's a lot of people that that help kids. There's a lot of people that just have money. They're, it's all over the place, but that is one of the common scenarios that I do see. Absolutely. Mom and dad come to the rescue, but even then, let's say you put 50% down, a $2 million home here is an average track home that's $200,000 in many other parts of the country. You're paying for location, 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 location. That's the number one thing in real estate. So, you know, for me, it's ridiculous because even if you give your kids a million dollars, so they only have to mortgage a million dollars. They still have a million dollar mortgage. Right. And, and for me, it just doesn't pencil out. I always talk about, does it pencil out? What's your cost with the standard amount down? Today's interest rate, not a rate buy down, not this, not that. Just today's interest rate, standard amount down. What's my payment? If it pencils out showing me that I'm within the property's rent range, I know it's probably a more healthy buy and a more safe buy. You're not getting that here. So you would have to come in with at least 50% down to make a property pencil out here where we're standing today. So it does make it a lot harder for people to get in. And I think people just put a lot of pressure to buy right now because of FOMO. We saw that the crisis created FOMO and everybody wanted to buy at any cost and go to any length to do it. And that's dangerous because your emotions are now driving the car and you just don't want that. And I'm whistleblowing it to the best of my ability, letting people know this is exactly what's going on. Okay. And how about like the actual profile of people? Like, all right, who is actually the buyer? Are they younger kids? Are they wealthy, older people, retired, that just have a lot of money? Like, who are they that have all this cash? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, you see a lot of different people. It's the high wage earner, the dual income, people that maybe have been saving a lot of money. And one of the things that we are seeing, Michael, this is really tricky too, 
is a lot of people, if you've got excessive amounts of cash in the bank, you're very exposed right now. So a lot of people like, I don't care if I'm buying a depreciated asset. I want my money out of the bank. I'm going to sit, just go ahead and buy some real estate because at least it's real estate, a tangible asset. Yeah. Um, so you do, you get a lot of people just deep pockets buying this stuff up to move their money out of this banking system. Like that's kind of scary actually, you know, now that I hear myself say it. Yeah, and honestly, that does make some sense, especially if you have a lot of money sitting in the bank. Honestly, I can't say I blame those people for doing that. Uh, it probably is safer in a real estate deal than it is in the bank right now, so that does make sense. But I just wanted to try to give the audience like an idea of you know, who all these people are because I feel like that's the number one burning question. I know for me, you know, as a visitor here and just seeing how much these houses cost, um, that's the constant thing that I'm always wondering is like, how do they have all this money? You know, who, who can actually afford this? Uh, I talked to a real estate agent in LA uh, a few days ago, and she said that she has clients that earn, you know, multiple six figure incomes. They do very well for themselves and they literally can't qualify to buy the homes. I mean, which makes no sense because these houses are still selling. So somebody's buying them. The reality is, like you said, there's just like a lot, you know, in a place like this, there's still a lot of money out there where people are willing to buy in this climate, mainly because they just don't understand the economics, right? Unless you've lived through a boom and a bust period as a bill paying adult, you may be, and even if you have, you might not be aware of if, if you know, what the magnitude of severity of the waters we're currently swimming in sure. but there's a lot of people that i always say your financial fitness i'm okay selling you a house if you if you're well insulated and i'm not about to exa exhaust your savings to do it let's go buy some houses but if you're you know gonna roll the dice and spend all your savings and be house poor um i just think you're better off waiting and being a renter personally yeah, so let's, let's get into that a little bit because that's something I wanted to ask you, Scott. I heard you say that on uh, Travis's channel the other day, Real Estate Mindset. So I wanted to kind of go into this with you because you say that if your uh, cost to carry the house, the mortgage, taxes, insurance, and all of this is more expensive than what you could potentially rent the property for, then you shouldn't buy it. It's kind of your standard advice, right? Yeah, well, you, you, yeah. But here in California, not even just in Santa Barbara, but pretty much everywhere in California, that's pretty much impossible. Like you can't really- Not, not everywhere, but in coastal communities, uh, destination cities like this, it's impossible. But we could go inland a couple hours from here, you know, Mojave Desert or Inland Empire. Uh, there's areas, there's still areas in California that are within the median home price average, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. You can get a house somewhere in California. It just won't be in an area like we're walking today. It, the desirable area. It's not going to be <laughs> desirable. And so I would rather rent and live in paradise than own in you know hell. But you know it it all comes down to how much you know money you have and are willing to spend. So in terms of you know, if you if you have a payment right now on a house, I don't care when you bought, if your payment is bigger than what the property would rent for, you don't own your house. Right, because if you it get into you. trouble, then you need to rent it or sell it, you're in trouble. You, you, you can't. can't really do it. I made that mistake in 07 I bought, and then the thing went upside down, the economy turned, layoffs started to spike, incomes went down, I checked the property's rent range to see if I could just put a renter in there while I figured things out, and I couldn't because my payment was bigger than its rent range. And so I didn't own the house, it owned me, and I think that's what people are gonna face in this bubble. I know it is. It's just, it's this the law of average, it's historical data. I mean, it just tells us, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes every single time. So I'm a little nervous about the people that bought and their house, they're not gonna have any hope other than let the house go because they, their payment's bigger than its rent range. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you, you don't just uh, talk the talk with that. You walk the walk because you actually rent yourself. Isn't that right? Like you don't, you don't own your house here. You're not going to pay double or triple for one of these houses. You rent because it's a lot cheaper. I own, I always say it's not important to own where you live. It's just important to own. Yeah. So I own. I did the same thing for a long time. I, I live in it. I, plus for me, I work in real estate. If I know once I sell you a house, it becomes all about the house. Every weekend you're gonna be at Home Depot and Lowe's and working on the house, the house, the house. My house is a box. Um, I, I don't, it doesn't bog me down, right? So 
yeah, I if I was to buy more property, which I probably will, it just wouldn't be here um, unless it, the bottom fall, fell out and I was able to get pennies on the dollar, which may or may not happen. But yeah, it's not important to own where you live. It's just important to own. One of the things I learned in 07, once I let that thing, I short sold the house, a successful short sale. It was about as painless as you could get through a situation like I went through. I decided I'd never put myself in that situation before again. And my quality of life is so good. And I talked to somebody much more successful than me that was renting. I said, why do you rent? You own all these properties. They're like, it's not important to own where you live. It's just important to own. We love renting because we can move whenever we want. We're not tied to the house. There's freedom. So, and you know, for me, unless it pencils out, no reason to, no reason to buy uh, if you can rent it for cheaper. If you can get, if you, if your monthly is, your monthly cost of living is better as a renter than keep renting and save your money, get some partners and go buy investment property. That's my advice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I did the same thing, Scott, but in Miami, it was actually the reverse because for a long time, renting was a lot cheaper than owning something. And then once the pandemic hit, that got flipped upside down practically overnight and renting became actually quite a bit more expensive than owning. And so I saw that happening as a local agent and I get a lot of haters on my channel that say, well, Michael, you bought, so you're telling everybody else not to buy, but like, yeah, I bought at pre-pandemic prices. My mortgage payment is lower than I would be paying if I was renting a similar place, so it makes sense, you know? So people need to just see that and put that into perspective because I think a lot of people just get this idea that owning a house is always going to be the best thing. So now there's this huge discrepancy in California when it comes to the cost to rent versus buy. I've seen it basically everywhere that I've stayed so far and visited. I mean, what do you see most people doing here? Do you, would you say that most people are looking for a place to live actually end up renting or they actually end up buying something? And if they do buy, what is their motivation to buy when you know the value is not there, when you can rent for half or a third of what it would cost to own? No, that's a really good question. Um, so most people, uh, have tunnel vision right now. They want to buy at any cost. I could show them a smoking rental and say, hey, let's sit this one out. Let's sit you on the sidelines, sit this one out. People just have the, this euphoria around the, the housing market right now. It was all born during stimulus and the crisis, of course. So yeah, I mean, it just depends. Um, you're, most people don't care right now. They don't understand the, the risk tolerance that's associated with buying in this climate they're just if they can qualify and some lender says hey we've created a creative loan product that qualifies you that's like some kind of creative lending we figure out a way that you can buy that's all people care about they don't care about the, what's going to happen well why would someone like that buy if do they know that they can rent for less or they just don't care like what is their mentality they're that measuring is because it's all i always talk about it's a psychological game what we tend to do as humans is and i pray like as a as a shark salesman this is something i would prey on although i don't have to anymore but we measure our insides by other people's outsides you go to work john just told you he's buying a house his agent's great the lender was great the house we're so excited and then you go home you're like honey John's buying a house. I, I, I think we should buy a house too. Yeah, and that's kind of what goes on. So it's more of a keeping up with the Jones thing, yeah. mixed with FOMO and the fear of missing out. It's kind of that's really the only reason that somebody would buy in this environment when it's literally cost double. To Unless buy. you are just so cash burdened, meaning you've got so much cash, I need cash, I need to deploy it. And that's something we also talk about is, you know, diversifying ourselves, right? You don't want all your eggs in one basket. I won't, I don't want you to own one, one house. I want you to own a bunch of houses. You might have to sacrifice now to ride off into the sunset later. You got to be willing to live in a cracker box temporarily and stack some properties. Yes. But you don't want to be cash poor or house poor. If that's you to buy the house, it's not worth it, especially right now. Now, maybe in a year or two or three, if we get a downturn, and there's like, okay, but it'll be hard for people to buy in that climate too, because everybody's gonna be running for the exit. So it'll be reverse FOMO. You'll be, you'll have money, but you'll be afraid to spend it because you don't want to catch a falling knife, right? Right, right, exactly. That really has to be it. I can't figure out any other logical explanation of why anybody would do this. Even for me, if I were to move here, I wouldn't see any value in buying something unless I could 
practically pay cash for the property or you know put a large enough down payment down where owning it would be less than renting but that would be the only scenario where i could see buying it would make any sense at all here yeah it's like here for example a subscriber right now we're writing an offer in northern california about two or three hours from where we're at today uh the house the newer construction three bedroom two bath granite recessed on the market for three hundred and fifty five thousand. Um, no, I would say, you know, we got a temperature check it. Let me call the selling side. Are you guys got any interest? No offers yet. Great. We're going to give you an offer. And then I'm like, do you, we're going to write at 330. Do you think 330,000? Do you think you can make it stick? Oh, I don't know. Well, listen, you don't have any other offers. So you know right. what? We're not married to this house. We're not in love with this house. I always tell people, don't fall in love with the house. Just don't fall in love with the house. Because if we're testing with an offer, it might not stick and we're going to walk. You ready to walk? If you're not, you better get ready if I'm your agent. So we're writing and we're all cash. This person's all cash buying in the median home price average price range. I'm okay with that. That I'm much more okay with than somebody buying where we're standing today and exhausting their savings to do it. And then their mortgage burden is bigger than its rent range. So I know if there's something happens to one of their incomes because they needed both to qualify anyway, they're losing the home and I get the call in the middle of the night, Scott, we don't know what to do. We're losing the home. Have you gotten any calls like that recently? Knock on wood, I haven't. But I've gotten a lot of subscribers. I talked to one today. Richard, um, sister's got a luxury home in, in Ohio, million dollar home, massive. It would be 10 million here, I'm sure. And they need to sell. They need to sell, Scott. We need to sell. And it just can't float it anymore. It's time to sell for whatever reason. There's many different reasons. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people I hear from. They're like, Scott, we. We need to sell. We've been watching you for a long time. We're, we, we think like you do. It's time to get out. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty crappy situation to be in for sure. This is something that I've been asking everybody that I encounter in California in general, especially since you're a resident here. What's your take on people leaving California? Because that's been a big trend that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. I think last year, California lost more people than it gained. Do you see people doing that? Do you have friends, family, neighbors that you know that went through that? And if you do, like, what were their motivations to get out of here? Well, it's, that's a good question. So yeah, California has become a very, let's see, I'm trying to be politically correct if I can. <laughs> it's got a lot of policy that's really turning people off and they and we knew that even in the in the crisis a lot of people fled California so some of the policy is not favorable at all and we're catering you know we got a homeless situation spiking we're just throwing money at it which is just putting fuel on that fire I always say if you furnish someone's rut they're gonna be a lot less likely to get out of it and that's what we're doing we're just furnishing people's ruts that they're in rather than forcing them to try to, to get out. Sure. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people leaving um, California for sure. Your quality of life in terms of, and we talked about this, I mean, look at, you get 300 days of sunshine a year on average. Uh, it's paradise on earth. And and policy is, is trying to ruin it, apparently. I mean, they're doing it basically either on accident or on purpose. I don't know what's going on. But yeah, when you start losing residents, that's not a good sign. Not only are they losing residents, but they're losing very wealthy residents yeah. that are a big part of their tax base here. Right. And that can leave a lot of other people that don't earn as much, you know, basically to make up the difference eventually. That's exactly right. You know, we got a lot of heavy hitters bolting out of here and I don't blame them. I, we were talking about this too. Like sometimes I ask myself, like, why are you still here? But then, you know, my lifestyle, I'm, I'm fortunate enough now where, you know, my lifestyle is very Southern California lifestyle. I'm very much into my hobbies and my sports, tennis, beach, motorcycles. Um, you know, it, it's all right here. Like I live in a vacation area, so it's hard for me to leave. And I've got my cost of living to a level, like I didn't try to live beyond my means. I, le I live below my means, yeah. if anything. And that's very hard to achieve here. And that's probably 
one of the main things that keeps you here, I would imagine. I mean, the lifestyle here is second to none. The weather is second to none. And if you can top that off with an affordable cost of living, I mean, you got it made, Scott. Yeah, knock on wood. You know, like I don't take anything for granted. I know what it's like. That's why, unless you've suffered a little blowback, had to dig yourself out before, um, I know what it's like to be paycheck to paycheck. I know what it's like to be house poor. I've walked in those shoes. I don't regret it now because what I've learned and the gratitude I have for what I've accomplished now. But I take zero for granted. Um, this is just all fluff to me now. That's why I'm here running my mouth on YouTube, you know, because uh, I just don't care anymore. I don't care what people think about me like I used to. Like, of course, a little bit maybe, but uh, I try to put other people's needs before my own. I'm just doing my best to do that. You know, we, the million dollar question now is just like, am I right or are they right? There's two sides of the aisle now on the economic fitness of the country and more specifically the biggest asset class in the world, the U.S. real estate market. It's been handicapped and we haven't even talked about the biggest elephant in the room. And even in this town, uh, you can go down the main street and see four lease signs littering every other store and those are attached to who the banks right the banks are carrying bad toxic debt so the the writings on the wall the birth pains of a crash are displaying themselves the data won't reveal it yet go look at the for lease signs are you seeing them that's the birth pains of a downturn yeah you know i went to uh, state street here in santa barbara last night for dinner and i walked down there and uh, it's, everything was empty, man. It was like 8 o'clock at night, and it was pretty dead over there. And that's kind of surprising for me coming from Miami because we have a similar setup in Miami called uh, Lincoln Road. And it's like a pedestrian road like that. You walk down there, there's all these stores and restaurants. You go down there at 8 o'clock at night, I don't care what day of the week, and it's always happening, yeah. you know? I mean, I was kind of shocked to see that. Because I, I, eat, I eat dinner late usually, right? Because I play late. Like usually by sunset, okay, I'm going home, I'm going to shower, it's yeah, 8 o'clock. Where am I going to eat? And, Everything's uh, closed. Yeah. My cook's not at home right now. I'm fending for myself. I'm losing weight. And uh, and I'm so busy playing. I, I skip meals. And so I go, where can I go? And it's like, you got to, uh, you're limited to where you can go. So yeah, it's really stifled in terms of that. The contraction of people just reducing back because they can't afford it. I mean, there's still a lot of people out there spending money for sure, especially in a town like this. But you're right. I mean, stores downtown, okay, we have two malls in town at our local malls. There's one upper town, one lower town. Both malls have an anchor store. That's how most of these malls lay out. Big anchor store opposing ends, ends with stores in the middle. This mall downtown in the Million Dollar District, which continues to keep their streets shut down to traffic, which is ridiculous. It's only foot traffic only when it was designed for cars or handicapping the area. Both anchor stores, Macy's and Nordstrom, both gone. So the, the stores in the middle, the smaller shops are being evaporated and right. only restaurants are able to somehow pull this off because people are still willing to go out and get a decent meal. But the retail environments, it just evaporated. So the other mall has one Macy's, but the other anchor store is gone. So they're down to one anchor store. The other mall has zero anchor stores. The one that is open is probably on performance-based rents, meaning they're not paying rent because the place looks horrible the lights are out at night you drive by like there's no light like they're open but you would never know like it's a big macy's like kids how expensive is it to light up your sign on the side of that building like i just can't get it for the life of me so yeah we've got some pretty big warning signs and birth pains that the data is not going to show us you have to use your own and that's why i would say i'm a walking talking temperature check i go to sales meetings i feed you guys intel there I go to local malls, I feed you intel there. It's really reading between the lines and looking between the cracks because the, by the time it hits, if you weren't halfway prepared for this, you're gonna be a deer in the headlights, it'll be too late for you. But if you halfway expected it, you're gonna be able to operate within it much more efficiently. That's why I wanna congratulate all your viewers for tuning into you and listening to you because you, you're giving it to them straight. And the if, if and when this plays out, they're gonna be much better equipped to navigate through it, having at least heard it. I wish I heard these messages back in the last yeah, bubble. I absolutely. Did. I mean, stuff like this didn't really exist back then. I mean, YouTube existed, but it was in its infancy and you really couldn't get information like this, especially on a daily basis like we're putting out. So 
it's definitely easier today to be prepared and if you choose to ignore it that's on you so another thing i want to touch on here when i was down there on state street i probably saw about 10 different homeless people when i was there it wasn't that crazy you know it wasn't so many but i didn't see any tents or anything like that like you see in like uh la or in san francisco where people are like camping out on the sidewalks like do you guys have that here and if you do like how bad is the problem does it affect people's buying decision like if there's a homeless encampment in front of somebody's neighborhood are people buying in areas like that like what's the situation there well here in santa barbara not so much but we have a pretty big population but we have huge outreach shelters that are now catering to them now, what you will notice if you drive down our freeway system, you're gonna notice Caltrans or freeway workers doing massive amounts of cleanup along the freeway because they were encamped on the sides of the freeways in the, in the tree lines. So now we're basically, we're going, they're all kind of hiding in bushes. And there's a lot of shelters uh, here in Santa Barbara, but it's no Skid Row LA, the biggest homeless population in the world is just minutes from us and they bus them up from Skid Row to here because we have such phenomenal places to panhandle, rich people, s services available for them, shelter, showers, food. It's just like they, this is paradise for them. But for the most part, you don't really see them out like we would see in like L.A. Okay, they're so the problem is not as visible here. It's... it's it's not that big of a deal, I guess. It's a big deal. It it's a big deal everywhere. It's out there. We've got a ton of it, and it's only getting worse. Uh, but it used to be non-existent. When I was a kid, I remember riding my bike down State Street. One homeless guy in town. It was the one town homeless guy. We all knew him. Not anymore. I mean, they're everywhere. Almost every... We, a lot of off-ramps. You got people... Uh, they're, they're there, just not at the levels that you would see with tent cities, Skid Row... It's not, if you're trying to, you know, capture that type of footage, Santa Barbara's probably not the place. But yeah, we, we, we have our share of it here and it's, and it's growing. I see. So, I mean, does Santa Barbara have any laws against that? Because when I was in uh, Venice Beach, they have signs posted everywhere now that if you set up shop here, you set up a, a camp or anything like that, then they'll take your stuff out of there immediately and they'll impound it and you have 90 days to come pick it up like are they strict on that here or what's the deal with that yeah i don't know i don't know i know we have a couple homeless shelters if they what they do is they usually they pick you up either take you to jail or drop you off at the homeless shelter most homeless people don't want to go to the homeless shelter because if you go to the homeless shelter you can't drink so most people are like screw that i'm gonna live on the beach and it's not as needed as we'll see. Like I had a client in uh, Santa Monica, like dude, if, uh, I got my multi-million dollar beach home, homeless camp just popped up behind it. And uh, now I, I can't sell it. Like how am I supposed to show your house if you got a homeless camp? Right. And that's when I, you know, you have to call somebody and say, hey, I need, I need to get, some. but then during quarantine, we can't displace them because they need to be able to quarantine in place. So sorry, you got a homeless camp in front of you. And, People were just not happy. So that was a more of a pandemic related problem. Like where people can't do anything about it when that pops up in front of your house. Exactly. I so see. during the crisis, they, they weren't displacing them because they needed they just needed them to be able to shelter in place. And if that happened to be in front of your house, sorry, so that no, was just unlucky. So no doubt if that happens to you, if you live somewhere here in California, that's gonna affect the material value of your home, no? It doesn't help. It doesn't help. It does not help. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. One last thing, Scott. California state income tax. It's the highest uh, income tax in the entire state and the entire country. And uh, is that something that bothers you? I mean, does that really affect, you know, your income in a way that's like, man, I can't believe I got to pay this all the time. Like, how do you feel about that? All right. So here we go. Here's some more armchair psychology from Scott Walters. Today's problems for me are yesterday's dreams. So yes, I'm taxed pretty hard. The t my tax bill is, is, is astronomical for like, I've, I, but that's a quality problem. I've never paid more taxes than I'm paying now, but a lot of it's also income related. But yeah, it's a little shocking and disheartening when I can go, wow, you know, I could relocate and probably, and if I was maybe a little smarter and shrewder, I could probably tech, set up some more tax shelters for myself. 
but the tax the tax exposure here in California is insane and then a lot of people are mad because you're getting taxed to death but you're not getting anything in return you got a problem at the house good luck getting the police out you got homeless out in front good luck getting them removed you know it's like where's my tax i see people uh, i i'm stuck in traffic for hours a day because you guys want to paint some new lines and now i'm tied up in traffic and paying for the lines why not do it at night instead of the height of rush hour right. like there i could go on and on and on right income tax property tax like property tax alone is just like insane like i look at these i was covering jim carrey's brentwood home the other day he's stuck on the market sucking air and going through price reductions a kiss of death and just the property tax on his house alone was like i don't know i think twenty five thirty thousand dollars a month oh wow um, <laughs> like so the luxury is in bad shape luxury is going to take a hit luxury will take a hit because your buyer pool is so much smaller to pull from like the, that's why you want cheap afford all my rentals cheap affordable rentals that appeal to a wide range of rent i give them a deal on rent i don't price gouge them i get happy tenants don't leave they feel like they get a deal they don't bother me and they don't leave tenant turnover is not my friend if I price gouge them, they're going to jump ship on me the second they find a better deal. And then I got tenant turnover and that little bit of extra rent I was making doesn't pencil out anymore because I'm missing months rent and I got to clean the place up and be down for a while. People are stuck in that. That's a whole separate video too. But yeah, a lot of luxury homes are hitting the market. A lot of celebrity homes hitting the market. Yeah, I mean, the tax situation here with the, you know, a lot of people like to say, well, in California, we have Proposition 13, so that limits how much your taxes are going to go up. Well, it doesn't really matter if you buy a $4 million house, you're still going to be stuck at that tax base from when you bought the house. It might not go up a lot every year afterwards, but you're still stuck with this huge payment every year. So it's one of those things. It's crazy here. That's why I wanted to get you on the show and just get your take on all of this. And uh, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. It's always an honor and a privilege to share any information that I have and help people. It's the highest calling that, that you can have in life is to help others. And I agree. You know, I think just the, the smart move right now is, is really just insulate yourself. If you're exposed, just you know, understand, like these are things that will you'll look back on later in life and and won't regret it if you learn something from it and um you know it's the tail end of a crisis front end of a recession that's the realities right so it's now seeing can we orchestrate the the soft landing or not and nobody can guarantee a crash but all indicators for me are pointing towards one what what it'll look like this time is yet to be seen correction recession depression those are the three levels of an economic downturn we're in the correction phase now if we can't stop it we will be in a recession level and if we can't stop it there we will hit the depression level so our job now is to continue to band together stay together monitor it so no matter what comes we'll have at least talked about it in a way that was constructive I agree. Like I said, Scott, thanks for being on. You can find Scott over at Scott Walters right here on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next one to come out, check this one out right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.